Hi everyone, good morning, and I welcome you all to the Hindu newspaper analysis discussion. Guys, in this particular session, we are going to cover entire analysis of Hindu as well as important articles with respect to UPSC CSE examination. We are also going to cover, and here on the screen you can see articles that we are going to cover for mains examination, articles that we are going to cover for prelims examination, and for mapping today we are going to cover UAE as Prime Minister has visited the UAE. Also, along with these, we are going to take up one quotation for our essay as well as an answer writing and current affair based MCQ questions also we are going to take for our practice session. So guys, that is all about the important coverage articles. Now let's discuss them in detail. But before that, I would first like to take MCQ questions for your revision. Now, please pause the video and attempt these questions and leave your answer in comment box and make it a habit that every day you will be attempting these questions because these questions are framed from previous days articles so if you have this compulsion of attempting the question every day the previous day you will be much careful while reading or while going through the paper so the first question that we have today is consider following statement with respect to swachta green leaf rating it has been launched by Ministry of Rural uh, Development. The new rating system ensures clean and hygienic standards at airport and railway station. So choose the correct option and leave your answer in comment box. Second question that we have, uh, who developed Swati portal, which is a platform for Indian women and girls in STEM fields, Ministry of Education, Labor and Employment, Science and Technology, Indian Council of Agricultural Research. Then third question, consider following statement with respect to women's changing role in India. We have discussed this also. India's female labor force participation rate increased from 2017 to 22-23. Find as per annual periodic labor force survey. Over the decade, female enrollment in higher education has risen dramatically by 90%. Then third question, which of the following statement regarding the India-UA relationship is true? The UAE is India's largest trading partner. UAE is part of India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor. Uh, just a minute. Sorry. Uh, so these were the three questions. This question already we have taken yesterday. So now we are going to see answers of them. So which statement is true? So here the correct answer is B. Correct answer is B. Statement B is true. Now why B is true? Now you see that bilateral trade as we talk about between the two countries, it grew to $85 billion in 2023, making UAE India's third largest trading partner and India's second largest export destination. So therefore, the first statement is not correct. And UAE India both are also the part of India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor. That is true. It was launched at G20. So B statement is right. Fine. Then moving on question, uh, next question, which of the following is not the tributary of Krishna. So correct option is C, Pain Ganga. Pain Ganga is not the tributary of uh, Krishna. Then next, consider the following statement with respect to formaldehyde. So we have discussed this also that a new technology, new AI based detector by the frozen ice has been made to detect formaldehyde. So what it, what the formaldehyde is, it is colorless. It is used as food preservative. Okay. It is flammable at room temperature. It is non-toxic. It is non-toxic. Fine. So which statement? Uh, now here what you need to do is uh, this question got incomplete. Here what you need to do? You need to tell which is not correct. You need to tell which is not correct. Okay. So it is non-toxic. It is toxic gas. Highly toxic gas. So D will be the answer. So that is all guys about uh, the questions. I hope that you are attempting them and you are also getting utility out of it. Now let's discuss all the articles for today one by one in detail. Now moving on. So first article that we are going to take is on the rights of forest dwellers on the rights of forest dwellers. So basically what has happened and why this particular article has come in the news before that uh, we'll take what is utility of this particular article. So this particular article is going to be important for GS paper number two issues related to social justice issues related to social justice as well as in GS paper number two vulnerable sections of Indian society there we will also take this particular article. Now let's get started. First of all guys recently what has happened there is this Thanthai Periyar Sanctuary there is this Thanthai Periyar Sanctuary where it is located it is located in 
in the state of Tamil Nadu. It is located in the state of Tamil Nadu. And this particular sanctuary is surrounded by the other protected areas also. Let's see them also. So basically it is it is located between Satya Mangalam Tiger Reserve of Tamil Nadu and Male, Male Mahadeshwara Wildlife Sanctuary and Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary of Karnataka. So on the sides of Karnataka, there are these two sanctuaries that is Male Mahadeshwara Wildlife Sanctuary and Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary on the side of Karnataka and on the side of Tamil Nadu there is Satya Mangalam Tiger Reserve and in between this there is a Santhai Periyar Sanctuary in Tamil Nadu. Now for mapping also this is an important thing for your prelims examination. So please pay attention on this. Now what has happened? There are the six tribal villages that are located in this particular sanctuary that is the Thanthai Periyar sanctuary and these particular villagers they have been denied the basic amenities, basic amenities, basic rights have been denied. Why? Because forest authorities say that these particular villages are not the revenue villages. They are not revenue villages. Now guys understand this particular thing that basically guys uh, here before going in this particular article we need to go little bit in background. So basically British, British when they came in India, British came out with their forest act, British came out with their forest act and in this particular forest act what happened forest were considered as the state property forest were considered as the state property and all the people tribal people living on the forest they were declared as encroachers they were declared as the encroachers okay and what happened all the villages that were there in the forest they were declared as the forest village means the villages enacted villages erected over the government land illegally and Britishers all the time they had the power that whenever they want they can remove these forest villages if they want to use that land or if they want to cut down the trees there they can uh, uh, remove these tribals because they were de declared as encroachers so for centuries tribal people they have been denied the rights tribal people have been denied the rights okay now basically guys what happened way back in 1990 way back in 1990 Union Ministry of Environment, Union Ministry of Environment, they declared that all the forest villages that are there in the jungles, they will be converted to revenue villages, revenue villages. Now, revenue villages are the ones which have given the revenue to the government and these villages are in the role or basically these particular villages are notified in the records of the government and then government is obligated to provide them water connection let's say for example right now jal jivan mission is going on which aims to provide functional household tap connection by 2024 okay soch bharat abhiyan is going on okay avas yojana is going on so they are to be provided to those villages which are into the records of the government so declaring a village as a revenue village means that it has been notified in the official records of the government and now all the schemes everything will go there so all forest villages were to be converted in revenue village government notified in 1990 in this particular thing okay now guys after this there is also one more important piece of law, law has come that is the forest right act so forest right act will come in 2006 and will this will also repeat the same thing that all the uh, forest villages will be converted in revenue villages tribal people there they will be also be given the uh, titles to their land Community rights will be given. I'll come on that particular in a minute. Now guys, understand this particular thing that this is one situation. There is also one more law that I would like to discuss here. That is Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Now Wildlife Protection Act 1972 aims to preserve the wildlife in the forest. And basically for the preservation of wildlife, Wildlife Protection Act empowers the government that they can declare the areas of forests as sanctuaries as well as national parks. And in these sanctuaries and national park, people will be given restricted rights. Usually in the sanctuaries, more rights are given to people. Only those rights will be restricted which government will specifically notify but largely the rights are given into the sanctuary but in national park but in national park largely almost the rights of the people are not allowed 
Okay, people inside sanctuaries continue to enjoy all the rights unless prohibited, but they don't enjoy the rights in national park. Grazing is not allowed in national park and many such kind of activity is not allowed in national park. This is something that can be done as per the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. So, in fact, the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 has often come in conflict with the tribal people's welfare because it is said that they are not being given their basic entitlements on land, grazing is not being allowed to them. Now, this particular thing came to the limelight over a period of time and in 2004, there was this Supreme Court order given in the Godvarman case, Godvarman versus Union of India. Now, Godvarman versus Union of India was for the protection of the forest, but in this particular case, government of India acknowledged this particular thing that a lot of historical injustice have been done to tribal forest dwellers by not recognizing their traditional right, but that problem will now be rectified. And therefore, what happened in 2006, 2006, Indian government came out with the FRA, FRA, FRA stands for Forest Right Act and this Forest Right Act has been brought to remove this historical injustice where the tribal people were denied their rights on forest. So this injustice is to be rectified by this Forest Right Act. Now when we talk about Forest Right Act, let's discuss little bit about this Forest Right Act. Now, number one. As per this Forest Right Act, land titles are to be given. Land titles are to be given to tribal people. Individual land titles are to be given up till 4 hectares. Okay. Also, then what will be done? Also, then what will be done? They will be given the community rights. Community rights. For example, let's say there is a pond. There is a pond. And all the tribal people, they catch fish in this pond. So, community right over this pond will be given to the entire community. Then they were also given that they can collect the minor forest produce. They can collect the minor forest produce, certain type of leaves, etc. They can collect. Okay. Fine. Non-timber minor forest produce they can collect. This is something that was provided to them. Similarly, then it was provided that the Gram Sabhas, Gram Sabhas will be empowered that if any tribal people land, let's say, is to be diverted. If, for example, let's say it is very important that we need to develop a highway, fine, from our jungle, very important. Now, you need land, tribal people's land will be needed. So, Gram Sabhas approval was made mandatory. So, a lot of power was given to Gram Sabhas also. So, Forest Right Act was called as an act which recognized the rights of tribal people. And what it did, it gave back them, it recognized their ancestral land, their habitat. Also, it authorized Gram Sabha to determine and recognize forest rights. Fine. If somebody did not got right, fine. Their notification or their recognition will also be done by the Gram Sabha. So, this was brought to balance tribal as well as wildlife. Okay, tribal as well as wildlife. Now, understand this thing. When we talk about the Forest Right Act, it came in 2006. And when we talk about the Wildlife Protection Act, it came in 1972. So, Forest Right Act is a later law. And because of that, if wanted, if needed, Forest Right Act can override the Wildlife Protection Act. It can override the Wildlife Protection Act if they are not synchronized together. So, therefore, Today, if under the Wildlife Protection Act, a protected area is being notified and under this protected area, if let's say somebody will not be allowed to graze and let's say if they are the tribal people, so basically their forest rights, their rights are getting diluted. They might say that it is, an, it, it is a challenge against the Forest Right Act. So basically, let's say there is a particular place, government wants to declare it as a national park. Before that, they want to take an approval. They need to take an approval from the Gram Sabhas that can we declare it as a national park and can we restrict these kind of activities or not. But fine, this is something that is there. Now, basically it has been provided that when we talk about the Forest Right Act, any violation in the Forest Right Act can also be uh, any violation if it is happening, any right is being derived, then that particular thing can be registered as a crime under under the Scheduled Tribe Prevention of Atrocities Act, fine, that can also be registered as a crime. Now, what has happened? In the case of Tamil Nadu, cattle grazers have not been allowed to graze in the Thanthai Periyar Sanctuary. Basic rights have been denied to them. And why it is happening? Because in 2022, Madras High Court had given one particular judgment. First of all, earlier judgment of Madras High Court was this, that there will be the total ban on cattle grazing in all the forests of Tamil Nadu, okay, but then what happened, it got restricted to National Park Sanctuary and Tiger Reserve. 
Now guys understand this thing how you can do this thing this is outrightly going against the forest right act forest right act so because of this particular thing there is this issue controversy going in in Tamil Nadu so I hope that you have understood it so this is guys all about it and not only we have understood this article but entire background in holistic sense whatever important aspects are there we have understood that also so this is guys all about it and with this we come to an end to this article and now we'll move to next article Okay, so this is one more article. Why India needs deep industrialization? Now, this article we are going to see with respect to GS paper number three issues related to Indian economy. Okay, and let's get started with this particular article. So, article talks about the COVID-19 pandemic. So, as COVID-19 pandemic came, it changed the way as how economies were how economies were driven. Okay. Now understand this particular thing, understand this particular thing that it is being said that now the state intervention in economic policies has increased. Globalization is going back. And if we talk about state intervention in economy, we find that Inflation Reduction Act was passed in USA. European Green Deal was passed in European Union. Then Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan, Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan was started in India. All these particular initiatives aim to aim to increase the intervention by state in economy. For example, Inflation Reduction Act gave more power to the US government to interfere for the reduction of inflation. Similarly, European Green Deal focused on bringing the economic growth by focusing on renewables and green infrastructure and green industries. Atmanibra Bharat Abhiyan focus on capacity building of Indian industries. Okay, now India actually recovered quickly from the pandemic. But again and again, this particular thing comes, again and again, this particular thing comes that India has not, India has never seen the complete or full-fledged industrialization. There is a premature de-industrialization that has happened in India. So just a little bit of industrial development happened and then we move to de-industrialization. Over the 75 years, India's share of industries in output, in employment has been very much less. Indian industries, they have contributed less than 20% in the GDP of India. Even majority of employment generation that has happened, that is also not in manufacturing, but it is in the other sectors. For example, it is there in the agriculture, it is there in the service, but manufacturing sector, neither they created jobs nor they contributed to the GDP. So question comes that why India has not been able to do that and how to break this particular stagnation of industry. So here there is one book by Mr. Raghuram Rajan and Rohit Lama, you already be knowing about the Raghuram Rajan, former RBI chief. They write in a book, Breaking the Mold, Breaking the Mold, Reimagining India's Economic Future. So in this particular book, they say that India's economic growth will not come by manufacturing sector, but it will come by high skill service sector, high skill service sector. So India will see high skill service sector driven growth, high skill service sector driven growth now even guys today we talk about the service sector service sector has matured earlier than manufacturing and more than 60 percent of gdp in the indian economy is contributed by the service sector now article provides this particular thing that actually suggestion given by here these economists it might not be right why because it is being said that it is how you can bet on manufacturing uh, say, uh, service sector before making the manufacturing sector matured. So what are the problems in this? We are going to discuss them one by one. It has been provided. Let's see. When we talk about India's experience with service driven growth, it has led to certain problems. Number one, it was not able to absorb the labor exiting the agriculture. Now, the labor which exits the agriculture sector, they are either unskilled or they are semi-skilled. Now, they cannot be accommodated into the service sector where is a high skill needed. Okay, high skill needed, good communication is needed. Sometimes service sector jobs are such that a fluency in the English is also needed. So, people exiting from the agriculture sector might not find to get in the service sector quite easily. But in manufacturing sector, they can be absorbed. But in manufacturing sector, they can be absorbed. Okay, the next is, the, the next is that service sector required highly skilled workforce. But India 
What is the problem of India? Problem of India is not the workforce. We have a plenty of workforce. Problem is the skilled workforce. We don't have it. So therefore, service sector is might not be the right choice. Here there is let's say agriculture sector. You put the people in manufacturing sector. In the manufacturing sector, over a period of time, they will get trained. They will acquire the skill sets, and from here then they can move to the. They, from here then they can move to the service sector. This is something that is being suggested. Now it has also been provided that see. because we started focusing on service sector in the past early investments in higher educations were made early investments in the higher education is made now investing money in higher education is not bad we should do that and we have to do that but understand this thing that always government has a limited resource and when they are spending more money in the higher education less money is left for the mass school education and mass school education actually has not been given that much attention in the last few years okay also what has happened basically more money getting invested in the higher education premier institutions what has done it has helped the self serving elite people okay they are able to get advantage of this higher education it revolution came in india but industrial stagnation happened it revolution came but industrial revolution did not came okay also guys we see this particular thing that in rural india what happened rural india what happened okay we also have not focused on rural cottage industries has they have been focused by the china so china's growth why it comes because they invested heavily onto the rural cottage industries rural enterprises but we have not done why because our focus was on service sector not on manufacturing sector so we have done this particular thing in the past this was a mistake also it has been provided also it has been provided that high skill service which would suit that will suit a traditional lead but not the majority of the first generation graduates okay first generation graduate it will not help them because they still might not be comfortable in service sector but can be absorbed by the industry more easily so this is something that has been the problems with the focusing on service sector now what we need to do we need to first of all focus on the mass education mass education forest direct investment in india which was supposed supposed to diffuse technology has not happened so fdi did not brought a lot of technical know how for the manufacturing now we need to focus that how it should be brought upon also in the past india has looked upon certain occupation in manufacturing and production not in a good way for example electrics work welding work we have not seen them in a quite good light now that mindset also needs to get changed and wherever you can produce whatever you can produce whatever you can manufacture you can add value that is to be nurtured and has to be given importance so that is all guys about it and with this we come to an end to this article and now we'll move to next article old fashion trust and credibility behind india ua ties so yesterday guys also we have seen one article on india ua today also this article has come on india ua a very good article and if you club this article and the yesterday's article and takes the notes out of it then you need not to do anything on india ua relation question if it comes so let's get started with it we'll see this with respect to gs paper number 2 ir india ua relations okay so basically so basically what has happened right now we see that the world is involved into the transactional approach in foreign relations india if you remember also started with the strategic autonomy concept india also have strategic autonomy now when we talk about the strategic autonomy of india so it is based on the idea of the transactional approach means that india will not have any permanent friend india will not have any permanent enemy india's relation with every country will be guided on the basis of their national interest if india's national interest is getting served we will continue the relation but if india's national interest is not getting served we might not uh, pursue that relation might not pursue that relation very eagerly so transactional approach strategic autonomy is being followed by india and it is being followed by many other countries also and therefore having a permanent friend having a all weather friend is now not in fashion in international affairs but still india has one of a country which is a permanent friend permanent ally of india and that is uae that is uae okay now guys uh for uae we'll see the essential mapping also don't worry 
नो सो बेसिकली वट हैज हैपन वट हैज हैपन प्राइम मिनिस्टर ऑफ इंडिया हैज बीन इन्वाइटेड टू यू ए टू इनोग्रेट अ टेम्प टू इनोग्रेट द टेम्पल इन यू ए टू इनोग्रेट अ ग्रैंड टेम्पल इन यू ए सो बेसिकली when we talk about the relations there is actually a deep personal relationship also between prime minister of india and between the president of ua and this can be seen that in the last this can be seen because of the fact that this is third visit by prime minister to ua in the last 8 months this is the third visit in last 8 months okay this is one also we see that sheikh mohammed the president of ua has also been india quite regularly for example he came to india in the september 2023 to attend g20 meeting then in january 2024 he visited india to attend the vibrant gujarat global summit he was a chief guest there also when we since talk since 2015 prime minister of india has visited seven times ua seven times he has visited ua so this shows that how deep relation is there between india and ua why this time this time i already tell you that the visit uh okay it has been determined by the religious calendar and now the inauguration of grand hindu temple is to be done in abu dhabi okay also guys uh, this particular temple is being inaugurated because prime minister in 2015 specially requested the ua to allot the land for the construction of hindu temple because of the large number of hindu diaspora that is living there okay now so prime minister is also being made as the guest of honor at 11th world government summit in dubai now what is this world government summit so this world government summit is the counterpart or a kind of a uh, it is a it is a kind of a, a conference themed on the davos world economic forum conference so world economic forum it holds a conference in the davos switzerland every year where corporates government government representatives ngos they visit so in the same way government summit is being held by ue in dubai now this particular summit will attract government leaders head of international organization industrialist corporates thought leaders from the world and the focus of this particular summit this year is shaping future governments shaping future government and every government will put forward their ideas at what should be the focus of governance and likewise now also also the most important part of this particular visit most important part of this particular visit is that prime minister will kick start will start the bharat mart bharat mart now what is bharat mart bharat mart is an initiative of dubai based dp world dp world it is dubai based and then india's ministry of commerce and industry now why it is so basically this initiative is being brought to promote the to promote the exports by india's micro small and medium enterprises by providing them retail warehousing and logistic logistic facilities in dubai so basically msmes in india they are manufacturing they will export their products to dubai they uh, sorry they will export their pro products to the uae there they will be getting the warehousing facility logistic facility and then in this bharat mart in this bharat mart there will be around in this bharat mart there will be around 800 showrooms 18 were warehouses which will be spread over 1.3 million square feet okay so basically what can be done here indian products can be showcased indian products can be showcased so machinery electrical goods electronic products auto components medical equipments furniture apparel processed foods pharmaceutical okay all these products can be showcased and the buyers from iran central asia africa middle east and other countries they can come and they can negotiate they can trade with the indian msmes and their representatives so this bharat mart it is a kind of a showroom it is a kind of a, a, a basically public marketplace of indian msmes in ua so this is something that is being done and prime minister is going to inaugurate it now when we talk about bharat mart when we talk about bharat mart this project comes on the heels of the ambitious india ue comprehensive economic partnership agreement sipa yesterday if you remember we have discussed that india ue sipa was signed in the record time in just 88 days india ue sipa was signed and after this comprehensive economic partnership agreement has been signed there is increase in the india ue trade also 
So India UAE trade has been increased by 16 percent and has reached 25 billion dollar. It is to uh, it, it it should go beyond 100 billion dollar. That is the goal. But already 16 percent growth is there. So it shows that how India UAE trade is uh, fostering and India has become the third largest trading partner. Okay. Now <clears throat> further moving on. When we talk about guys the SEPA, SEPA, Bharat Mart, SEPA, Bharat Mart and individualistic ties between India and UAE, they can put impetus to India's exported goods in this particular region. Also guys, if you remember yesterday I told you that UAE and India has also settled an agreement that the trade will be carried in domestic currencies. They will not be dependent too much on dollar. So because of SEPA, trade will increase. Because of Bharat Mart, a lot of trade goods will go to uh, Dubai. And all these uh, transactions will be settled into the domestic currencies. So this is something that is an added advantage. Also, Indian Institute of Technology, IIT Delhi, has started its master's program in energy transition and sustainability at Abu Dhabi campus. Abu Dhabi campus. Also, investments from Abu Dhabi to India has also increased. And today we find this particular thing that UAE is the fourth highest source of FDI in India in 2023. Okay, and Abu Dhabi Investment Authority will op open a, a, a particular of special office in Gift City, Gujarat. So this shows that how deep is economic convergence between India and UAE. And right now this talk that is coming, it is coming on the time when there is a war going on in Gaza between Israel and um, leaders of Hamas. Also, the Houthis they have they started attack in the Red Sea on the ships, particularly the ships going or coming from the Israel. Now, if you remember guys, India Middle East Europe economic corridor has already been launched and both India and UAE are partners in that. If this particular thing will not be stopped, then the trade uh, of these both the countries will get impacted. So that things will also be discussed here. So this is guys all about it. And now we'll move to next article. Okay, so here we have this article, <coughs> brumation, brumation. Now, so this uh, often in prelims examination, these kind of keywords, fine, they have been asked already. So on this particular line, we are going to cover this particular article, brumation. So basically, what is brumation? Brumation, it is, it can be defined as the period of dormancy or slowed activity in reptiles, such as hibernation in mammals so hibernation happens in mammals but let's say there are the bears during the winters bears will go in the state of hibernation where they will be almost dormant almost dormant it is a mechanism to save energy it is a mechanism to save energy okay so as hibernation is done by mammals in the cold periods in the same way reptiles what they do they do brumation they do brumation in this brumation in this brumation, reptiles, they will retreat to underground burrows or rock cervixes, the spaces between the rocks or other sheltered areas where temperature is stable. Their metabolism slows significantly. And as their metabolism slows significantly, they need not, they not need more energy. They don't need food. Now understand this thing, guys, that you might be knowing or not be knowing what is the major expenditure of your body in terms of energy. You don't spend more energy in talking, doing things, but you spend more energy by doing basic activities, breathing, your heart is beating. It needs a lot of energy. Your metabolism needs a lot of energy. So their metabolism slows down and they can live for months and months without eating okay so this is a way to conserve energy minimize their resource requirement and the species such as box turtle painted turtle also do that okay and the lizards reptiles also do that so this is about the brumation brumation okay so brumation is a reptile version of hibernation during winters find all they do it fine so i hope that you have understood it then next is 3D printed brain tissues, 3D printed brain tissues. Now, guys, there's a 3D printing, fine, again, science and technology, 3D printing has made a lot of progress in the last few years. And now scientists, they have also created the world's first 3D printed brain tissue. 
वर्ल्ड फर्स्ट थ्री डी प्रिंटेड ब्रेन टिश्यू विच कैन मिमिक द नेचुरल ब्रेन बिहेवियर एंड इज अ वेरी बिग ब्रेक थ्रू इन न्यूरो साइंस नाउ गाइज देर आर मेनी ऑफ द डी जेनरेटिव ब्रेन डिसऑर्डर दैट आर देयर एंड बिकॉज ऑफ दिस डी जेनरेटिव ब्रेन डिसऑर्डर देयर ट्रीटमेंट इज नॉट पॉसिबल ओके सो देर फॉर दिस थ्री डी प्रिंटेड ब्रेन टिश्यूज कैन हेल्प now uh, unlike the conventional methods this approach involves stacking layer horizontally and using a soft softer bio ink gel to support brain cells allowing neurons to grow and communicate effectively within the tissue now guys there are billions and billions of neural networks that are there in our brain which exchange information which uh, guides the which guides the voluntary and voluntary activities and such so basically these uh, 3d printed 3d printed uh, tissues will not be an obstruction in the neural network connection and communication so this holds a huge uh, Im uh, implication for the people suffering with the alzheimer disease parkinson disease okay so this is about it i hope you have understood it and now moving to next article bond yield bond yield so this is a concept of economy let's see this so basically what has happened so it has been provided by recently the governor said that as inflation continues to moderate bond yields will also soft and borrowing cost will come down so understand this thing guys that when inflation increases what happens in inflation there is a cheap money excess money that is flowing in economy we need to suck out this particular economy uh, sorry we need to suck out this particular excess money so for that what we do we need money borrowing expensive and inflation leads to high interest rates inflation leads to high interest rates so during inflation interest rates are high borrowing becomes expensive but now as inflation is cooling down it will bring the borrowing cost also down now what will be the impact on bond yield let's understand that so basically first of all what is a bond so bond is a fixed income instrument where investors put the money and they get a particular interest rate or a particular upfront payment they get so bond is an instrument by which a person can raise money okay and the investor will get a assured income if they invest into the bond now when we talk about the duration of a bond it is uh, issued um, yeah, basically it will be different depending on the term of the maturity now usually understand this thing that bonds they are issued at discount they are issued at discount for example I come out with this thing that I need hundred rupees, and I need these hundred rupees for ten years. I need these hundred rupees for ten years. Okay. Now what I am doing? What I am doing? I will raise this particular money by selling the bonds. I will raise this particular money by selling the bonds. What I will do? I say this particular thing that okay, I am selling you one fifty rupee bond. Okay. Just a minute. Face price of the face value of this particular bond is one hundred fifty rupees. I am giving you this particular bond at a discount that is hundred rupees. Today you give me hundred rupees. After ten years, I will give you one hundred fifty rupees. So you are getting fifty rupees extra. This fifty rupee is your interest, a kind of an interest or a kind of a profit, whatever you want to say. This fifty rupees is this. So basically, bond are issued at discount and they are redeemed at the face value. Usually, this happens. Usually, this happens. And this particular money that is hundred rupees that the government is getting, they will use it for their infrastructure, anything, whatever they want. Now, what is bond yield? What is bond yield? Bond yield is the return that an investor will get over a bond. The fifty rupees you divide it. with the years for which the bond is issued what are you will get per year that is your bond yield bond yield okay now understand this particular thing guys that bond let's say it is issued by the government but then these bonds are also available in the market for example i got this particular bond for 100 rupees face value is 150 rupees i can sell this particular bond let's say i need urgently money i will send to somebody that okay you take my bond at uh, 95 rupees i bought it at 100 you take it 95 i need urgently money i can sell it to another person at discount or i can sell it at a premium also for example i got it at 100 i will sell that okay i am ready to give it to you at 105 rupees you will get 150 rupees okay so i am ready to sell you so these bonds then they trade into the secondary market these bonds then they trade into the secondary markets where they can be bought at par discount premium prices in the secondary market now the price at which the bond is being traded it will affect the yield it will affect the yield now understand this particular thing that if a bond price goes up 
for example it issues at 100 rupees and in the secondary market let's say it is being traded at 110 let's say now it is being traded 115 120 now you see at the end you are going to get only 150 but you bought it at 120 or you bought it at 100 where you will get more you will get more when you buy at 100 rupees so understand this particular thing that bond yield okay so when interest rate decline uh, bond yield it impacts it it behaves on the basis of the pricing if the price of the bond it goes down fine if it, the price bond price increases bond price increases yield decreases yield decreases and vice versa okay so this is all about the bonds fine now guys uh, today in the mapping uh, we are going to cover the mapping of ua now one thing i want to tell ua mapping some days back we have taken also but now we are revising it why because multiple developments have happened in ua cop 28 was held in U ua now prime minister has visited ua so it is uh, something that a question can come so because of this particular thing uh, we are revising this ua india mapping please ensure that you give more attention here so basically guys here we see that UAE is there. Now it is considered as the country in the Middle East. It is considered as a country in the Middle East or in now Middle East. Uh, basically Middle East is largely used by the US. We consider it in the West Asia. West Asia. So Middle East, West Asia. Now Middle East is a little bit a bigger area. It includes this particular region also. All this region is included in the Middle East. But West Asia is largely this particular region this particular region africa will not be included now when we talk about ua when we talk about ua so some important things you need to see about the ua first of all yes first of all guys we find this particular thing that the tropic of cancer tropic of cancer it divides ua it divides ua and here we see that there is the strait of hormuz there is strait of hormuz and here we have the persian gulf persian gulf so basically here we have iran so iran and ue they are in between between iran and ue there is a strait of hormuz that lies strait of hormuz that lies now when we talk about when we talk about the ue one very important aspect of ue is this rub al khali desert now this rub al khali desert it is shared between a lot multiple countries for example saudi arabia Saudi Arabia is there, Oman is there, UAE is there. This desert is shared by all these countries. Now, so when we talk about the other aspects of UAE, so UAE is mostly arid with extensive sand deserts interspersed with the mangroves and the marshes. And petroleum industry dominates this UAE. Now, when we talk about UAE, UAE, find south of UAE is the Strait of Hormuz, Strait of Hormuz and 87% of the UAE is made up of the largest emirate and the largest emirate is Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi. Now, when we talk about the borders, the borders are shared by the Oman, Saudi Arabia, Oman and Saudi Arabia are two border uh, neighbors and marine boundaries are shared with the Iran and Qatar in the Persian Gulf and important geographical feature is that it is uh, bordered by outer parts are bordered by the Rubal Al Khali Desert, Rubal Al Khali Desert, and there is the Hajar Mountains that are on the northeastern side and Jabal Yibir. It is the highest peak of the nation. So that is all, guys, about it. So I hope, guys, that you have liked the video and you are enjoying the session. With this, we come to an end and please do comment and please do tell us that how well you are liking it. Thank you so much.